Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today from around Australia. I'm Debbie Pryor, the Artistic Programs Manager at Guildhouse, and I'm very excited to welcome you to this revision speaker series. This series of conversations is aimed at increasing connectivity within the arts during this time of disconnect, to offer an opportunity for artists to increase their well-being and to find new models of sustainability for their practice. Community is at the heart of the September sessions. Speakers and participants will unpack the ways in which they create, engage with and serve communities, especially in times of crisis. Complementing the speaker series for South Australian artists is a tech mentor program, enabling artists to grow skills where they're needed most. We have more info on the tech mentorships on our website with the first round of interest for the mentorships closing on September 30. So please feel free to check that out. Guildhouse has received support from the Australia Council ADAPT Fund for the Revision Program, in addition to support from the Day Family Foundation and Creative Partnerships Australia, for which we are very grateful. I'm speaking with you from Ghana land in South Australia, and I pay my respects to the traditional elders of this land, past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge the rich and ongoing creative culture of the Aboriginal people. Today I'll be talking to Lisa Wayup and Ingrid Werner, and before we begin, I'll quickly go through some housekeeping. You can ask questions at any time in the chat box below. Um, we'll address them during the Q&A, which is towards the end of the session. Uh, in the chat, you can type, I'd like to ask a question, if you'd like to literally ask the question, and we'll turn your mic on during the Q&A session and prompt you to speak. Um, aside from that, please keep your mic turned off as the incidental or background noise easily filters through. We also have some links in the chat enabling you to read this session through a live transcription service. And we also welcome you to say hi and tell us the land you are joining us from. Lisa Wayup is an artist and curator of Gudamanjara, Torres Strait Islander and Italian heritage based in South East Melbourne. Her practice is comprised of printmaking and distinct mixed media weaving techniques, including woven sculptures, vessels and body adornment. Weaving is an important medium for Lisa, symbolising social and cultural continuity. It's an act of cohesion between the past and present and offers a metaphorical connection to place and to kin. Ingrid Werner began her life in the Australian fashion industry as one half of the cult label TV, alongside Monica Tywinick from 2006 to 2011. In 2012, she launched Werner, a boutique women's wear brand based in Melbourne. The Werner collections feature a luxurious aesthetic with simple lines, high quality fabric and innovative shapes, as you can see. Werner is known for addressing issues of nationalism, identity and the body politic through her designs, as well as collaborating with visual artists such as Melbourne-based painter Gian Manik and of course, Lisa Wayup. I'm very excited to introduce Lisa and Ingrid to this session. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to begin by um, asking you to unpack your practice. Um, I think it's best to hear about an artist's practice from their own, in their own voice, in their own words. So we'll start with Lisa and I'll ask Victoria, our moderator, to just um, share her screen and some images of Lisa that you can uh, talk to. Um, which is just happening. Thanks, Victoria. So thank you, Lisa. Whenever you're ready, if you'd like to um, introduce your practice to us. Thank you, Debbie, and also to Guildhouse for having us. Um, before I begin, um, we would like to acknowledge the traditional lands that both Ingrid and I live and work on, the lands of the Bunwurrung and the Bunurong and the Wurundjeri peoples, um, their elders past, present and yet to emerge. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge those of the Great Kulin Nation and the innate connections First People have with this land and its waterways. We would also like to acknowledge the sacred lands that Guildhouse is placed on, the lands of the Ghana people, and any First Nations people that join us today. Welcome. Okay, so my practice, I consider myself a multidisciplinary artist. So I like to work with lots of different mediums. And I guess basically for me, it's a vehicle for storytelling. Um, and the majority of my pieces that I create um, really reflect my history. And at times it's really quite fractured history. Um, my family 
and I guess my connections to country and culture as well. So that's done, as you've seen in some of the slides just that have been shown, uh, the different types of mediums that I use. So I, I have a great love for paper, which I think that really started my practice many, many years ago. And um, I work at an Aboriginal arts centre in Mornington in Victoria called Bullock Arts. And from being a part of Bullock Arts, I was taught how to weave. So I started weaving in about 2012. So I still feel like I'm a bit of a novice when it comes to, to weaving. And I think the big drive to find weaving was to have that connection. I guess it's something that would have been passed down through the matrilineal line from generation to generation. So it was something that I really wanted to learn and with the hope of passing it on to my girls as well. Um, this piece that I that that's showing, um, it's called Encircled Families and it's a, a work on paper, it's, um, a print, inkjet print. And the idea of this was showing two family members coming together, two family groups. So this is when I first met my um, Aboriginal birth mother. And these were documents that were given to me through the Freedom of Information Act when I first met her. So it was detailing her um, time in state homes from the age of five years old. And this number that was just, you can see some numbers at the top of the page. So that was numbers that she was known by in all of her documentation. And I guess the idea of it wasn't for people to read the documents. It was just the idea of that layering of history. So the two circles, for me, circles mean family. That's my kind of symbol for family. So it's these two groups that are coming together. And the linear work is like a defragment. Defra it's, yeah, it's fragment. <laughs> it's um yeah it's 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 showing fragments of um a shield so that idea of protection and um i guess it's going down to the wood grain of the shield yeah um the next slide is actually showing a project that i did with baluk arts i was the curator of a show called turidan which means banya in bunwarang language and this is our mural that was created with Bullock Arts artists and it's totally out of bull kelp. Um, so bull kelp was introduced to us by Ani Nenet Shaw, a Tasmanian elder who works with um, kelp. So she came down and did a residency with some of our artists at Bullock Arts some years ago. And from that, we just, the love of kelp grew. So we created this mural out of, um, out of kelp and bones and there's ghost net and this is hairy this is hairy man so he's um he's he's he gives really good hugs hairy he's just he's got prosthetic teeth and his rib cage is um kangaroo ribs and um so it was just that idea this collaboration was working with seven aboriginal organizations around victoria from um, elder groups to drug and alcohol groups for women and for youth. Um, and we created nine sculptures, lifelike sculptures. And I guess the story that really came from this was about, um, especially from the elders talking about how um, we've been taught these stories. And I found that it was a universal story, really, you know, it was about the bunyip and I guess a lot of going around water holes or not to venture too far from home. You know, I grew up with the boogeyman as a child and, you know, like in America, they've got the Sasquatch and, you know, so it was these creatures that were created as a warning, you know, to take care of, of children. Mm. So that, that exhibition has um, gone around. Uh, I think it's been seen three times. It was supposed to be seen also this year, but due to COVID, it's been postponed for another year or so up in Hillsville. So, and we've been lucky enough for each of the openings, we've had Uncle Jack Charles there. So he's been a bit of our mascot for our Tourism project. And I love how we kind of um, referred to himself as a bunyip and, you know, it was just, this was great, this show at 45 Downstairs, because we had dry ice. So it created like this mist on the ground. And originally I wanted to have scents, you know, smell of rotting things. And, um, but e each of the bunyips have like a little sound that go with it. Um, yeah, the sound of the, the actual bunyip, which each of those communities made the sounds too. Yeah. 
Um, this was, uh, I just wanted to kind of talk about different types of commissions and, you know, I guess the idea that, um, you know, the uh, not commissions, but collaborations and just how respectfully collaborations can, can work. Um, this was a collaboration I did with, it was a commission that I did for um, AXA, it was their membership a couple of years ago. And so when you become a member, you'd get one of these bottle top brooches. So they're all made from bottle tops. And I like the idea of using discarded items or things that people walk past and don't even kind of think twice about and then giving them a different life and turning it into something quite precious. So we, we actually got commissioned to create a thousand of them. So it took me some time to do them. And I got my children involved, um, mainly my two daughters. My dad actually flattens the bottle tops and he still does. He's 87 years old and he flattens them to perfection. Yeah. And then we paint on them. So they're all different. There was none that were the same. They were all little one-off pieces. Um, this was a show that I did at Linden New Art um, in last year, and it was a show. It had components. So I created also a part of it with Bullock artists, mm -hmm. and this was a solo that I had, and there was also another solo component by another one of our artists called Dominic White, and this show was called Carry Me Softly. So it was talking about, um, I guess, the idea of mother and. You know, I, I created Coolamans and these again, this is a um, design which then carried over to the collaboration with Ingrid, which we'll talk about in a bit also. So this is um, continuity and the idea of this print, which was originally from a drawing that I did in my um, visual diary. It was, it's called continuity without stagnation. So a lot of ideas that I create and a lot of motives that I do are circles. So this was an idea of a square and, you know, the idea that you can have resting points in a square and time to rest, time to reassess and time to see where you're going. So that's the idea of this image. But I was lucky to work with Stuart Russell at um, Spacecraft in Collingwood in Melbourne here, um, who Ingrid and I also worked with to start with the um, the second collection that we did. We did printmaking with him, which was a dream, yeah. Um, these are figures that I've done this year, um, which it's actually got into um, to the National Works on Paper at the Mornington Peninsula Regional Gallery, which will be opening a bit later this year. And I guess it's a common thread in my um, practice. Again, it's talking about my matrilineal line, um, my connections to it. So these figures, the first one is actually representing myself and my children down in the little nest at the feet. And then the middle one is my mum that I've, that I've grown up with. And the, the one at the end is my birth mother and um, siblings in, in the little nest as well. Um, this is shared culture. And again, this kind of came out from working with Annie and Annette Shaw. It's all kelp. So the idea of that was to, um, yeah, I guess that shared culture. So with, with Annie and Eddie coming and then um, for her to teach us about kelp and how to use it. And so I felt like that was a shared connection that we both had. Sorry, that's my dog. Um, this is looking through time. So again, you know, it's that idea of, Going back, this there's actually parts in this vessel that are missing. You can't see it from this photo. Um, these beautiful photos were taken by Fred Crow. So we'd have ha, had a lot to do with Fred. And um, I just think that he was able to take these photos with much respect. And the, these images were actually from an exhibition I curated at the Nella Regional Gallery um, some a couple of years ago. me. <laughs> <laughs> and, geez, I think I got um, Fred's name wrong in the caption so thanks for correcting that Lisa. No, it's great to hear a bit more about your practice and I look forward to unpacking that a bit more when we talk with Ingrid about the collaboration as well. Ingrid I'd love to invite you to talk about your work, your practice as well. Victoria can I ask you to um, screen share yet again? <laughs> 
Okay. Should I wait for the screen? Look, I might just talk because I, um, I'll let the photos just run through. Um, I thought I'd start off by, um, because I'm not a fine artist, I guess I'd talk a little bit about um, just my trajectory and my career. I, I uh, when I graduated from RMIT, I won a big national award um, that sort of projected me into into sort of starting my own brand, um, and that was in my in my twenties, I think, back in two thousand and six. Um, and I started a brand with my um, with my friend Monica Taiwanek, um, and it was called TV. But it um, she was a knitter, so already through that collaborative process, um, I was sort of um, really interested in textiles, um, in textile development, in knitwear. Um, and it was a very uh, sort of exploratory brand and we really sort of tried to push um, the textiles as far as we could. Um, unfortunately, that was sort of a very hard thing to do, I think, at that stage in my career because, um, yeah, I was very young, but I'd also just gone straight from university to starting a brand and I just found that um, there were lots of holes in my knowledge in terms of, of how to operate commercially. Um, and so I, that sort of disbanded after four or five years. Um, and I went, I actually moved home to Brisbane um, for a few years and I worked for Easton Pearson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that brand, but um, that was a really interesting time for me uh, within my career. And I guess just really filled in a lot of the gaps that were there in terms of how I could um, come to sort of find, pay myself <laughs> and run um, just a sustainable um, sort of business at the size that I was comfortable with, because I guess, you know, Eastern Pearson was relatively small in comparison to sort of a lot of those sort of big brands that were out there that I applied, could or could have applied to work for. So I was lucky that I sort of was still in that sort of smaller, sort of more sort of workroom hands-on environment, which was really good. Um, yeah, I, le I learned a lot. It was a very intense way of working. We were sort of just in this, it was me and another girl who were in charge of doing the diffusion range for them. Um, so we were in this sort of small windowless alcove and we had sort of four different types of fabric that we were allowed to use. And I'm not sure if you've seen Eastern Pearson's work, but it's very print heavy. It's very trim and embellishment heavy. Um, it's heavy on the colors. So we had bolts of white cloth, um, not a lot of variety, sitting in India, which we had to choose all the colors, do all of the, the print designs. We had to do all of the trim designs. We had to do all of the garment designs um, just from this tiny little room. Um, and just be constantly trying to sort of think of new um, ways to sort of um, mm -hmm. <laughs> turn these sort of four choices into these amazing outcomes, um, which, yeah, was, was difficult, but sort of incredible training, I think, for me. Um, and again, it just got me really sort of interested in surface um, in that relationship between sort of surface and structural design and, and how, those two, how those two things talk to one another. Um, so I ended up moving back to Melbourne um, after doing a, a little, a small stint there at Eastern Pearson and had a baby and, and decided I'd sort of try to start my own thing. Um, and I guess the dream was to start something that was self-sustainable um, but was also just sort of small and that I could handle, you know, and that was not something that just sort of took on um, a, a force of its own and, and required me to sort of be slavishly product developing constantly. Um, that was something that existed as a creative outlet for me. Um, and I guess because collaboration has always been uh, what I've loved to do, um, but it's not always... I, I, and but I see, but I saw it as something through my experience that's not always possible. And so I guess what I've tried to create is a business where, you know, I, I'm 
ultimately I, I have all this opportunity to work by myself and for myself, but then I get to sort of step outside of that and um, collaborate with other people for certain times and on certain projects. So I feel very lucky that that seems to have been what's what's happened and that I'm at a you know comfortable place at the moment um, with my business and practice where yeah it's sort of just sort of just rolls over and I, I don't I don't feel as though I'm slavishly sort of um, having to um, hit the seasons and hit the trends and um, mm -hmm. I get to sort of work um, work quite independently and release things um to my to my small group of stores and, and release things online when i'm ready and and in the way that i sort of see fit um yeah um i guess yeah i like how small and local um my brand is um and as i said yeah i'm just really interested in that in that dialogue between um, surface and structural design. I'm also sort of really interested um, in Australian identity and I guess um, trying to think about um, Australian cultural reality rather than the sort of kitsch representation of Australiana that's often sort of offered up and continuously offered up. Um, yeah, I sort of see opportunity in the absence of traditional dress codes in Australia. I'm not, yeah, I think as designers, Australian designers, we t we too often and too easily adapt American and European philosophies of dress. And I sort of see, um, I see the absence of that as, as, as a sort of, I see the opportunity in the absence of that and that we live in sort of a vast and sort of isolated space where anything is possible. Mm. Um, we don't sort of, we don't live with those traditions. Um, yeah, um, I think I like, I think there's an approachability and a sort of a wearability um, that I like to sort of look at with my work. Um, and I like offering flattering shapes for women that provide a sense of equality and freedom. Um, yeah, I think that's I'm really out of here. Sorry, I could, I could go on, but I'm just sort of like, oh, I don't do this very often. So thanks for bearing with me. No, it's wonderful. It's um, I think it's it's really interesting to see um, both of your practice in, individually, where you've come from, what you're what you've done, what you're doing now, because I think that really does inform how you collaborate and why you collaborate together. And I think, um, you know, we don't often see good, you know, we don't we not often have good examples of collaboration, particularly with Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal artists and businesses. So it's, it's really important that we get to kind of shine a light on this collaboration so that others can see how it can be done. So thank you so much for sharing your ind independent practices. Um, we might, do yet another screen share and show some images from your wonderful collaboration. And I might um, prompt the beginning of our conversation yeah. by um, mentioning that I, I know the two of you were introduced through Creative Victoria, through Liz Little in particular, who then introduced you to Craft Victoria and Sarah Weston. And, and um, through those two meetings, you, um, grew your collaboration you met for the first time and I'm wondering if you could talk us through what that looks like when you meet each other for the first time and and grow this really um what seems like a genuine and um very trusted relationship between the two of you mm, um I'm happy to say start something Ingrid yeah after you Liz um, I, th I think when Liz Little first approached me about this collaboration, I thought all my dreams had come true because <laughs> it's something that I've really um, enjoyed and, you know, I've always had a love for fashion. Um, you know, even as a younger person, I used to create my own, um, uh, my own designs. Um, my my mum that I've grown up with, her mum was actually a seamstress in Italy. So it was something that was passed on to my mum, that I that idea and that love of creating 
um, clothing. So it's something that she passed on to me. So we used to make lots of clothes together. You know, this is when I was probably very, very early teenager. So it's something that I've always had a great passion for. And um, yeah, the idea of creating clothing um, and, you know, being a different medium for me to use. And I guess these images were all very uh, 2D, you know, they were all images from my visual diary. So when I saw them actually be put onto models and then that kind of became animated walking down catwalks or having these amazing photo shoots with um, Indigenous models and, you know, it just took on a whole new meaning to it. So, and I just think the cuts were very respectfully using the, um, the images as well. I know that this one, Ingrid, was probably a tricky one to use this pattern, <laughs> this mm. design. Um, and I think, you know, from this, this is from the first collection that we had done together um, and with Craft and Sarah Weston. So from that, we kind of learnt a lot. And um, this image is actually called Homeward Boundaries. So it's, again, it's showing the, the central figure as, you know, family and I guess just the different directions to where family and the paths that we can link to. So that's where that kind of image came from. And it's also got um, half circles up top and bottom as well. So showing these different family groups coming together with, with my central family. Yeah. But even the colours, like, you know, the colours were very inspired by... I guess, Australian landscapes and, you know, I just, it was really like Ingrid was, a, a you know, the, the driving force with the colours because I was, worked very much so in monochrome, a lot of, all the drawings are black and white. So to bring a colour into it, it wasn't something that I was really used to doing, but I, the colours that came through in this were just amazing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I think, um, I think having Sarah as a as a sort of mentor and mediator yep. for that first collection was really fantastic. And just just in general, in terms of collaborations, I think you know that sort of role of introducing and fostering collaboration, um, I think, is a really important and underrated one. I agree. Um, and even even if sort of they just having a third person or a mediator or somebody to kind of help that process especially at the beginning I think is a is a good one to do and look I think I think you know Craft Victoria has has organized a lot of these sorts of collaborations but I do um I feel as though you know ours would probably stand out as one of the the more successful ones and I was just trying to reflect, I guess, over the last couple of days on, on why that is, you know. Yeah. Because really I mean Often there's a there's an initial introduction made or there's a there's a first collaboration, but it you know it's rare that it continues and it moves forward and, and it's rare that it finds a life of its own and and sort of momentum of its own mm -hmm. where it has has done here. And I'm I'm very grateful that it has because it's just yeah, it seems to just have found its own its own steam and its own yep. thing and its own aesthetic. It's sort of fallen into place almost magically, which is mm. really good. And I, I think just another thing I, I want to say on collaboration um, is that I think, you know, you do get very used to working on your own. Um, um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a relief when you get to, go and do something with somebody else you know it's a bit of a treat um mm. especially if you have a sort of business like mine which is just you know just me um so yeah i think that's that's been a really special thing um and i think i think what really helps make it successful is just always I think within that collaborative space, it's, it's no longer about you and your decisions independently. And I think always sort of reminding yourself of that mm. um, to take yourself out of it a little bit. And I think, you know, we, especially when you're sort of handling something as beautiful as, as Lisa's drawings and prints, you know, sometimes less is more, you know, like you sort of step back and, and let the work speak for itself. You know, in terms of the scale, the placement, that sort of thing. 
Sorry, can you talk, sorry, Ingrid, can you talk us through that process of how you receive the drawings and you transform that into a wearable piece, especially if you're playing with colour on a monochrome print? How do you, what is that process of visualising it in 3D? Oh, God. Well, yeah, I think that's what really, that sort of interest um, definitely sort of underpins my whole approach. But, um. Yeah, I mean, God, it's really hard to describe, isn't it? Lisa gave me the, her beautiful visual diary. It feels very stressful, um, just because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's such a pre it's such precious stuff to be working with. Um, but I guess it's just about testing, isn't it? It's just about testing lots of different options, lots of different scales. Um, I don't really work in Photoshop. I sort of work a lot in cut paper, but I get you know, my, my graphic designer to sometimes do a few mock-ups or, yeah. And I don't know, I think the silhouettes offered are, are not, are, are quite modern. Um, and yeah, I think, I'm just trying to think about what sort of sets it apart from other things within this sort of sector. Um, I think the scale is really important. I think really making sure that, that, that the boldness of the work, even though they're sort of sitting within an A4 page, that sort of idea of mm. seeing, seeing the prints being blown up and the, and the sort of the boldness of, of Lisa's line work. Um, mm. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. It does. <laughs> but I think also the popularity or the success is because an audience who's ready, they're waiting for a good true collaboration and one that seems to um, have that transparency and that honesty where you you can see both sides coming to, to the project. And I think since your collaboration, we've seen some other really successful um, collaborations. I guess there's, there's Gorman and Mankacher's collection. Mm -hmm. We've seen... Um, you know, even Instagram pages like Trading Black that are really making sure that people are um, are working together in in um, a respectful and honest and open way. And I wonder whether you've had, because you seem to be one of the first collaborations that have done that so successfully, I wonder whether either of you have had people approach you about the ways in which you can make sure that your collaboration is is strong and and sustainable because so many collaborations are one-off but yours mm. is is continuing you've got you've had other collections mm. i think i think a big drive behind having a second collection was that it was so well received mm. and um i guess you know for myself i love that you know fashion is able to embody story so it you know, it's able to um, evoke conversations between people. Like, you know, people have contacted me saying, you know, I wore your piece, um, mm -hmm. yours and Ingrid's piece down the street today. And, you know, every time I wear it, somebody stops me and they'll, they'll ask about the piece, you know. So in some ways, it's, you know, it's really showing a different way for us to be able to express our stories and to be able to, to get our message out there. And, you know, I'm just very thankful that it was a you know, a very positive collaboration and it's something that, you know, I'd, I'd love to continue. And at one stage, um, when was it, last year or the year before, you know, we got offered to do Hong Kong Business and Design Week and I was offered to, you know, would you like to do another collection, Lisa? Who would you like to work with? And I'm like, well, Ingrid, you know, because it was just <laughs> such a great experience and, you know, it's like why throw baby out with the bathwater, you know? Yeah. She understands me. She she knows my story, and she's able to translate it within, you know, a different visual way. So you know, it was a bit of a no-brainer for me, and you know, it was such a great experience for us to be able to to do that because a film was created as well. This is with Philip Boone and Sharina um, Clampton was also a part of it, and um, you know, many others. And it was all Indigenous design um, models that were used and. You know, it just sort of opened my eyes up again to another layer of, of what this industry is. You know, I felt like I've gone into it. Like I thought being an artist, you know, I know a bit about the industry, but, you know, this is a completely different industry. So it's like, and just how, you know, with, with Ingrid's knowledge and how she's able to kind of translate to me 
um, I think it shows in these garments that, you know, it's been a really great meld and, you know, it's, it's been respective, uh, respectful on both sides. Yeah. I think we've both taught each other a lot of things. Yeah. For sure. Lisa, I'm interested to know, obviously, but before this work, your work was shown within a gallery setting or maybe a retail setting. What is it like for you to see your work outside of that setting and on the streets and have people come up and not say, oh, I saw this in a gallery, but actually say, I'm wearing this piece? <laughs> what, does that, what does that feel like? It must be such a different experience. Oh, most definitely. It's, it's, it's really quite crazy. Yeah, I got, I can't... <laughs> I can't remember her name and I should have written it down, but the, it's the lady from NITV. There's a footy show and um, her name slipped my mind for the moment. It's Bianca. And she sent me a photo that she was in um, one of the frill dresses from this collection and she did an NIT uh, session on, on one of the um, shows for the football. She's a sports editor. So, you know, just seeing that and for people to be able to reach out. And I think social mm -hmm. media these days, you're able to reach out to anybody and everybody. And, you know, I just get a massive thrill that people can connect with it and that, um, you know, they feel proud in wearing it and they feel like there's a connection uh, with the understanding of, of the story of it too. So it's, yeah, it's just unbelievable because, you know, the idea for, I guess, a lot of my practice is very much so exhibition um, mm. in gallery spaces. So, you know, going on to catwalks and, um, yeah, it was just, it's been amazing. I can't, you know, I can't thank enough. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We've got a few questions, but I've just got one question that I want to ask before we we hand over to people and maybe while I'm asking that, if you have any other questions, people out there, feel free to type them in the chat or request to, to talk yourself. But I want to ask Ingrid about, I guess, the, the stories behind your work. We've heard a little bit about the stories behind Lisa's work and I'm, um, I welcome more information on that too, Lisa. But I wonder in particular, Ingrid, with your, um, one of your, I think one of your first collections, Whitewash, that uh, looked at the Australian kitsch kind of iconography, exploring the, um, the, I guess, the black memorabilia of the white Australia policy. And I think that's not necessarily um, uh, such a concept that fashion goers expect to see within a collection. I think maybe sure politics perhaps around gender and size and, and those kind of conversations take place. But how was this, the whitewash conversation um, received by your audience? I just think it's important to be honest about the fact that, that racism is part of the Australian identity and yeah. it's a part of Australian history. So I guess when I was looking, um, and I've always been interested in, yeah, sort of Australian cultural reality and how to sort of um, reflect that, that reflections on the white Australia policy came up. They're also fused with ideas around children's wear and sort of softening um, quite divisive and hard topics. Um, yeah, and look, that was a bit of a learning experience for me, to be honest, because obviously it was a very divisive issue to be dealing with in terms of a fashion context. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not something I'd probably do again, to be honest, <laughs> because I don't think people like to see um, such, you know, sort of um, hard and divisive and, and difficult conversations being had within a fashion context. Mm. But I guess a collaboration also allows you to uh, steer a, a conversation as well. And it seems like having a collaboration with Lisa has been able to, yeah, to do that definitely. in a celebratory in way. In a celebratory way, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. But Lisa I guess it's still raising, um, you know, heavy content in issue as well. So, you know, mm -hmm. kind of telling, uh, yeah, the, the idea of telling story and somebody wearing that story, like it just, yeah. And, you know, so, some of those drawings, you know, the, the, the um, I guess the concept behind them, it's, it's about family and it's about, you know, at times it's about that fragmented connection with, with my family. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that is able to be discussed in a different medium, you know, so I think it's, 
it's still getting that voice out there, but in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where the power lies. Definitely. Thank you both. I'm going to um, look at some questions and again, please feel free to add any in if you have any. I'm going to read a few. The first one from Emma Fay. Questions for you both. What is your advice for artists who are keen to work in collaboration across different forms of visual culture? What is the best way to start these conversations? And a link to another recent collaboration. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think we've been really fortunate, Ingrid, that, you know, we've just kind of hit it off as soon as we met. So I think you need to have somebody that really respects your story and your, your designs and, um, or whatever, or your art practice. And I guess has um, that at the forefront of, of that collaboration that, you know, it's a, it's a respectful union and that, that each side of it is, expressing that in their in their way but it comes together I think that's a huge part of it yeah it's hard to say how you go about doing anything isn't it like yeah well you <laughs> know it works like, or it doesn't <laughs> I just feel like it sort of happened didn't it um, yeah. um and yeah I think that's the interesting thing about life isn't it it's like sometimes things just fall in your lap like this opportunity with Lisa um, was you know we were introduced we were sort of put together it's that balance between going out and seeking new things yeah. and seeking collaborations and then um, what sort of lands I mean I often I, I definitely I love to collaborate with people who are already in my life um, you know and a lot of my um, collaborations already sort of happen that way through friendships or extended friendships or networks in that way um mm. i think it's often a good start to look around look at who's around you and how you could you know people you already have an established relationship with and how you might mm. be able to um continue collaborating with them i mean mm. i'm funny i i, I mean I, I just keep collaborating with the people that I like to collaborate with. Whereas, you know, maybe other fashion brands, you know, collaborate with someone every, someone new every season or a new artist or a new person. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm sticking <laughs> to the people that I like to collaborate yeah. with. Yeah. I'm not collaborating with these new people. I don't know. <laughs> I like these people. Like, <laughs> these are my people. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm like, you know what, if someone new comes in that I really like and I meet them and it happens, then good. But yeah. I'm going to go and start emailing people and trying to drum up some new collaborators. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just going to keep doing the same ones with the same people. So the different yeah. things, obviously. Yeah. And sorry, if I can just jump in and sort of speak aloud, I think that sort of leads me to sort of think that there was actually a beautiful power of, of you being introduced by someone else. Um, yeah. and that, you, uh, you know, by people that were trusted by you both and, yeah. that, you know, you had sort of a bit of a navigation approach and I was just thinking about it from the perspective of, you know, emerging artists or even mid-career artists that would love yeah. to be working in this way, um, you know, perhaps not emailing people randomly, that's not necessarily going to get you the outcome that you're looking for, but working within a field of practice and forming connections within that circle might be a, another way of approaching it. Yeah, yeah completely. And I just think um, collaborations are so underrated. Like, you know, there's so much to learn from somebody else. Like, you know, for, for Ingrid, that's, you know, is, you know, her practice has just been absolutely incredible. So it's like for, for it to meld together and, you know, a lot of um, mm. the pieces that we put together, it also cross over to like my woven objects and, you know, having like there's a bit of a, a running thing that I do with my, my weaving is that, you know, I have these little red stitches in them. So that, that thing cross crossed over to this collection, the stitching was all done in red, you know, so it was that idea of bloodlines and, you know, um, connecting with family. So I like how they're able to kind of meld and move and work with each other. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because I think, you know, you're saying that, that collaborations are underrated and I think that's because a lot of them aren't true collaborations. That's yeah. the issue. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, you know, it works where you buy fabric from somewhere or you buy a design, you know, but they're not, they're, the whole process is yeah. integrated. Yeah. Um, it's more like, okay, I like your drawings, Lisa. Um, can yeah. you scan them to me, send them to me, and then that's it. That's where yeah. the conversation sort of ends. And, yeah. you know, I apply them to my existing practice and that's it, you know. But, yeah. Um, I think, 
I think it, when it's a true collaboration and it works, which is, you know, not always easy, it's, it's great. Yep, and yeah, I think communication. Word, yep, sorry. The word is bandied around, isn't it? Like mm-hmm. this collaboration, but it's yep. not really what's happening. Yeah, and that communication is key. Yeah. Like how many times did we get together, Ingrid, and just, you know, dream and talk about things and how it would work and how it would come together and mm-hmm. maybe not this and maybe that, mm-hmm. you know. So it was definitely, you know, a collaboration. Yes. Yeah. Did you talk about your expectations at the beginning about what you hoped to achieve from the collaboration? Yeah. I think so, most definitely. I mean, to tell you the truth, I didn't really know what to expect. Mm. So I guess it was something that evolved along the way. And to be able to see, you know, these drawings, um, you know, as I said before, become like this animated you know, movement of, of an extension of myself, you know, it was just, yeah, so I, it just evolved along the way and, yeah, the evolved, understanding. And oh, I, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's just sort of gradually becoming, you know, um, more aware of what, you know, what those expectations are or that those expectations are changing, you know. Yep. Some things have hit the mark and other things that yep. you know, have, have, have been part of collections and not where, you know, me or Lisa wants to take it. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a learning process, I think, you know, yep. and you learn through testing, trying yep. things out, seeing what works, what doesn't, you know, and, and it, especially I think with, with clothing and, and design, it's like, yeah, you're not, you're not getting it right straight away either, you know, you have... Yep successful areas and yep. successful areas and I think um I think you know what's super important to to lease is that you know it becomes even more accessible so you know it's it's available you know and and it's it's accessible to to all different bodies shapes genders you know that it's but it doesn't isolate people within that sort of um, sizing structure or, 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 you know, that wholesale structure that I have. And I mean, that's difficult for me. And, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a risky sort of area because, you know, I obviously already have an existing customer yeah. um, and I already have an existing sort of size range. And, you know, because I'm wholesaling, there's, there's all these standards that are already set up within, um, within that wholesale market so you know stores are expecting this only order this certain size range you know and that's all they order and so there's risk with now sort of trying to sort of take it further that you know you sort of it's it's managing that risk of sort of developing something new and and for a different customer while also sort of being able to look after the customer you already have um, yep. and the client you already have. So that's, that, that, that's tricky, but you know, I think it's, it takes a bit of, takes a bit of risk, doesn't it? And you've got to sort of back yourself and back what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of that in the sort of fashion game, um, especially because so much of it is direct to customer these days. Um, you are really sort of backing what you're doing and hoping that it will, fingers crossed that it will, you know, find a successful outcome in the marketplace. But, um, yeah, sorry, I just rambled. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Great ramble. I love it. Very <laughs> relevant. Um, I have a, another question that I'm going to read out from Henry Wolf. Uh, this is particularly for you, Lisa. The design artworks that you are creating carry personalised narratives where elements represent certain things. What happens when the, to these when the design or artwork is translated to garments? How does the meaning shift when produced in multiple where it could be worn and purchased by anyone? And does this ever run the risk of aestheticising the original work? Um, I think it's an extension of it. Like a, the, the great thing about the collections with Ingrid is it's slow fashion. So I see them as it's like limited edition um, art pieces. You know, it's it's like um, yeah, it's 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 body adornment. You know, it's um, it's yeah, living, moving art. I, I kind of see it as as well. So I think it being another way for me to be able to tell my story. I think it's it's really important. It's it's a huge part of it, and I don't think it's 
really being compromised because it's not mass produced, which yeah. is something that I'm not interested in at all. And I think it's, it's um, you know, the quality of the pieces show in, in the garments. And, you know, there's pieces there that, you know, for the ones that I have, I'll have in my wardrobe forever and I'll be pulling them out forever. So it's, it's something that, um, yeah, I think it's really important that I don't lose that and to be able to still express my story. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely a huge part of it. Yeah. Just to give you a perspective, you know, per per style, there's 15 to 20 made in in production. You know, it's not, this isn't the, the kind of business I have is not, it's it's not going to be mass produced. Um, yeah. And I love that. Yeah. 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 And then they're not going to be reproduced either. No. You know, they're, they're one off. Yeah. They were there for that time and that's it. I don't. I don't have, you know, I don't have a warehouse somewhere stockpiling thousands of Lisa Welp dresses, you know, that I'm going to mm. flog off to every Tom, Dick and Harry. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone else have any um, questions? Or actually, Ingrid and Lisa, do you have any questions of each other? You may not because you know each other so well. No, no, I'm okay, Lisa. <laughs> I'll text you later. Alrighty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I just, um, as I said before, and I'll say it again, you know, I'm just so thankful that I've been given this opportunity to, to work with Ingrid. And, yeah, ditto, Lisa. Yeah, and, you know, and even with Sarah Weston and, you know, just yeah. it's been such a huge part of the process. And, you know, she's, she's such a visionary as well. She's attention to detail type of person. So we've been able to really um, show it at its, at its best. That's my dog trying to get in. Yep. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, we're hopefully working with Sarah again on on a on a new sort of small smaller collection and um, something that maybe can um, sort of have different variations of and yep. sort of um, anyway to be continued. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And the idea of an exhibition as well. So you know, kind of melding both of our practices, mm. you know, which is you know, something that I'm really interested about too. And speaking of exhibition, you, the, the um, pieces have been collected by NGV, I hear. Yeah. How yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, it is. It's so exciting. And also um, Bendigo Regional Gallery, um, the Bendigo Art Gallery, they've got Pimpy coming up too. So that's an exhibition of First Nations designs. So that's been, um, thanks to COVID, it's been pushed back a little bit, but mm. they've also acquired some of the pieces to their collection as well, which is really exciting. Yeah, yeah I'm looking forward to that exhibition. Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. It's been an absolute delight to talk to you. Thank, thank you. you. A little round of applause. From our thank little you for your intro. And whatnot. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> And there's a few comments which we can see um, thanking you again for your inspirational talk and just to see um, thank you the, the fusion of art and fashion. So thank you so very, very much. Um, it's been thank really you. lovely to connect you with artists outside of your own state. And, um, yeah, I look forward to more of it. Thank you kindly. <laughs> thank for you. those um that are participating we're going to post a little link in the chat box and if you'd like to give us some feedback on this session that would be really wonderful as i mentioned earlier this is the first session of um a, a year-long series so anything that you can tell us that will help our presentation the next time and tailor it to your own needs is is really helpful to us um, this is um the second day of a three-day um series so uh to this afternoon, I'm talking to Kent Wilson from Kyneton. He is one of the co-founders of the Kyneton Contemporary Triennial. We're going to talk about um, collective uh, collaboration. So still on the theme of collaboration today, but talking about a, a wider community and potentially leveraging people within that community to start a bigger thing. Um, tomorrow, we will have Heidi Kenyon from Guildhouse host a session with Amy Hurrigan called Practical Tips and Tricks for Increasing Your Online Viability. And that evening, we will conclude the spring series with Guildhouse CEO Emma Fay, who asked a question earlier. 
she will speak with Daniel Slater from the Victoria Albert Museum in London and Lisa Slade from AGSA at 7 p.m. And they'll be talking again about community and how their institutions uh, connect and collect during this time, particularly pandemic times, but in general as well. So that'll be really interesting. Um, actually backtracking tonight, we have a really fun and wacky event online um, in a platform called Gather Town, where we will all um, be in the session as little avatars walking around talking to people and we'll have four um, prestigious guests curators from carriage works powerhouse museum national gallery victoria and stations gallery so it's the artist opportunity to connect with curators and also fellow artists so please sign up to that it will be a wacky fun time um, in coming weeks, we'll release some details about our summer series, so keep your eyes out for that. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a tech mentorship program with expressions of interest closing on September 30, so please feel free to check that out on our website um, as well. And again, thank you so much, Ingrid and Lisa. It was an absolute treasure to talk to you both. Thank you for your thank time. You. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, too. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.